Madaba Archaeological Park, the Amman Citadel, Islamic Aina in Aqaba, and was overall director of Acorns Petra Church project after the death of Dr. Kenneth Russell, who discovered the church. He also restored the Byzantine church, which we have right here in Dar al Dr. Patricia has worked on Acorns publication series, which is perhaps known for the designs of Jordan, but there are now several other volumes. In 1994, she began, she began the North Bridge project in Petra, and in 2003, moved to Beira. We are hosting them tonight in the framework of our exhibition, Palestine and Jordan, 1500-1900, where they will speak about their work in Petra. Welcome, everybody. for this introduction. And uh, I want to thank also Mrs. Shoban for inviting me and my wife to give something about the work that we did in Petra in particular. Doing it. Yeah, just it's going. Yeah. Doing it. So mainly I will concentrate my job on the Petra Church, the Basilica that uh, Started, uh, we started the excavation in 1972 after the death of Kent Russell who was preparing for this project and unfortunately he died from a tragic uh, sickness and uh, I had to carry on the excavation with uh, three co-directors, uh, Haria Amer, uh, speaking of Yema, and uh, Robert Chick. Uh, mainly, Acor was uh, doing, a, you know, with support about 30 different universities working in Jordan in archaeology, and we give a grant in the field of the humanity for a large number of people to come and do research in Jordan from North America and also from any place in the world. Uh, this is developed recently, especially with all the work that we did, we raised money for this uh, scholarship and the fellowship that we give uh, to come to Jordan and benefit from the rich heritage that we have here. Um, mainly, uh, ACOR has uh, several projects itself, other than the one we get from uh, universities excavating in Jordan. And our purpose really is to set an example for future archaeology in Jordan. Uh, we did, the early work that we did, it was mainly coming to a site that was left by other archaeologists for many years. Some of them, they were, they were buried for over a hundred years, like in Madaba and uh, on the <coughs> citadel, when we started the temple, the great temple of Amman. All these were worked by several people before we came in. And we started with the belief that whatever we're going to do, we would like to present our work in publication, first of all. And second, uh, we believe in consolidation, restoration, presentation of the site to the best it can be done. And the only site that we had the chance to do this uh, the uh, aim that we had uh, in our <coughs> mind, it was in Petra, where we were, we started a site from A to Z. We are responsible from the beginning to the end of the excavation and the work there. Uh, we budgeted for the project before we started. We did from the survey, we knew what we need. We found glass mosaics on the surface of the ground with gold leaf and uh, we thought we were going to find wall mosaics. And there was, as we, you can see, uh, this is the site where we started the excavation. This is just before we started uh, looking down from the, uh, the hill where the Krisha dug later. And then 
We started in the side, that's what you can see over the ground. Only this small arch indicating, uh, you know, an apse, especially with the uh, finds that we uh, found on the surface as mosaics, we, we thought we're going to find more mosaics. So we asked the donors to support this. Uh, th at that time, it was USAID, who gave us a million and fifty thousand dollars for the project because we calculated if we're going to find more mosaics, it means it needs a shelter, uh, and this means we need conservators to do deal with mosaic. We need conservators for the object, and we need uh, everything was prepared from the beginning before the work started. The money was put aside, and the work started with 23 professional archaeologists because at that time, and I think still today, it's the highest employment in the world. It's the uh, PhD in archaeology. So that uh, the beginning of the work, we did three sounding, and you know the, uh, these soundings they revealed some walls, and then the next, the, in the second part, uh, by the end of the excavation, we found that we have a church with the floor mosaic. All the wall mosaic collapsed with the church when the walls collapsed. It seems it had mosaic only in the on the dome or on the vault over the altar in the central apse and possibly between the colonnades that they run uh, along the, the nave of the church. So it was a beautiful mosaic and we were happy that we found something that to satisfy our uh, donors that we found the mosaic that we promised that we're going to find. Um, next please. What did they do for this? Pardon? What did they need? We, we, we will talk about that. The, soon after, uh, when we finished the excavation, uh, we had our architect who came and uh, recorded all the object, all the stones in the in the site. And uh, a historical architect, they can tell from the stones where it's neat, you know, it's not clear. They can tell how the building was before. So he prepared all the plans for the reconstruction of this church as it looked like during the Byzantine era when, because the church, uh, it went through several uh, uh, stages of reconstruction and remodeling. So we, we, what we have is the final phase of the church that dates uh, in the 6th century, sometimes maybe 550 or 513. Uh, AD. But there was earlier church, possibly it goes back to the 5th century or mid 5th century, uh, century when it was originally built. Uh, the apses were not there on the side, and uh, this uh, chancel that you see with three steps at the, at the end of the, of the eye at the nave, this was put later because we found under it a mosaic that ran to the end of the wall and uh, these wooden sticks, those are the line where we found the prints of the wood and anchoring on these columns on both sides for the wooden chancel that existed before they put a marble chancel and built this high uh, raised uh, chancel for the altar. So this chancel is put on the mosaic of the southern eye and on the mosaic of the northern Isle, which existed before they uh, changed the church. Uh, later on, they added this mosaic when they built this chancel, because this is the only one it fit correctly to it, and it looks it's added. And you will see also that the, the artwork there, it is completely different from the early ones here. And possibly this one is a much earlier, earlier piece that we have in the church. So this one is completely different. It's more stylized than this one here. Um, the mosaic, 
Well, this mosaic starts, uh, we have the two eyes, the southern eye and the northern eye here, with the winter, which have her name written here, and then we have the fisherman, and then Gay, the earth, with two babies on her hand, one on her back and one on the other hand that we can see, and her name on above. This lights are so strong. And then we have Okeanos. Okeanos is, um, is a sea god who usually is presented with uh, his bust coming out of the water. This is the first time we have Okeanos anywhere, fully standing, with one foot on a, on a uh, dolphin and holding a ship in one hand and an oar in the other. The, the one after, and this may signify that the water, the sea, is surrounding the earth which is the earth is here presented with gay. And above her, uh, above the, the Okeanos, we have the spring, which is a beautiful piece. I will show it to you later. And then we have Sophia in the middle of the mosaic as she is uh, with uh, the wisdom uh, ruling all over the, the whole world. And above that, we have a fisherman. And then we have the uh, presentation of summer. And then we have an eagle. Uh, which have significance, and then at the, at the top we have a vase with water representing Christianity and two doves as a Christian nourishing from the Christianity. The northern uh, eye is completely different and possibly it is later and it presents a vine coming from a vase uh, uh, in, in the middle of two peacocks which also present Christianity somehow and then the, the, the vine makes circlets and in these circlets we have a repetition of different types of animals the lion and the lamb, the bull and the leopard uh, and the people in black and white uh, and in the same time where we have lot here we will show it to you later and then it is a possible indication of heaven that's where we all going to live, uh, we'll be living in peace whether you are um, the, the wild animal and the people and the, and the, the chickens, everybody is going to be enjoying life. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is a detail of the southern eye with uh, uh, a rainy here, our beautiful piece, and Okeanos. And this is the fall, uh, which is at the top, just before the top, uh, holding a basket of fruit because this is the golden. Um, season where everything is right and she has bracelet with gold leaf on her hand and on her crown on her hair it is very rare to find gold and the mosaic on the floor and it still can be seen today next please and this is a, a clear uh, photo of Okeano with the dolphin and the ship and the oar and uh, the a detail of the of the spring with a rose in her hand uh, because she is the spring, you know, it's a rose and then she holding a bouquet of flowers next please and uh, this is summer she is holding a wheat, uh, a bunch of wheat and a sickle in her hand because this is when they collect uh, crops of the wheat next please this is the spring with her crown and with flowers and holding a a basket of flowers with uh, one rose in her hand and she is all with the jewelry, the, uh, her earrings and her necklace is indicating something about the spring itself as, as, as everything would be in colorful and decoration and in its beauty. The northern eye, is, I want to show you the, the top, is we have the land uh, and then we have this black boy and a white boy, both of them holding sacrifices of some sort, and in the middle we have all this uh, iconography that may represent uh, something, and in my view it's mainly things that deal with, uh, with the goddess or with the Virgin Mary in this case, and I predicted the church is going to be uh, named after the Virgin Mary, and sure enough after a few years the, in the text we found that the church was named after the Virgin Mary. But you can see this transition from paganism into Christianity, which happened in the fourth century, as far we can tell, possibly not true, possibly true, but a, 
a priest who came, his name is Barsoma, to Petra, and to destroy the pagan temples with 40 monks with him. And when he got to the gates of Petra, they were all prepared to fight with him. And it started raining, and they were, they had a drought for four years, so it's not a drop of rain. So they all took it as a good omen, and they converted to Christianity. Hallelujah. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is uh, another uh, uh, photo of Lot getting drunk, and we have his dog in the middle, and then he is standing on the other um, uh, circlet as a shepherd with a stick in his hand. It's more likely Lot, but we are not sure. This is a detail of the black boy, and this is a bird which is carried with the hunter on his back. Next. The upper panel that uh, in the southern eye that I told you it's the most recent piece, it, it, you can tell it's already becoming uh, abstract more than the detail that we've seen in the other uh, one. And, uh, but it's a repetition also of um, uh, a ram and uh, ostrich and uh, a deer. Uh, next piece. Uh, during all this work, we always believed in creating jobs. It's not just to, to do a job and publish a book alone. We uh, calculated our cost that 80% of the money goes to the workers and 20% uh, goes to the materials that we use. So we had a large number of um, uh, conservators and in the same time we had students that we taught them how to deal with mosaic or how to deal with conservation of pottery or with conservation of marble. And one of them, a Bedouin from Beni Sakhar, he was invited to go work in Ravenna in the most important mosaic in the world in San Vitali, uh, because he was so good and even he cannot barely write and read. So uh, others that we sent to the Getty in America, like Fatma Merri, and now she's doing her PhD in London. It was the beginning that started that and now they are doing very well. We have several other students that we supported and we got in this project that really we wanted in the future that Jordan will have uh, their own people that they can deal with the problems that are uh, facing uh, archaeology and conservation. <coughs> the war mosaic is only a small piece of it survived uh, that we can put together. It took two months to put this piece Together we have 70 crates of small pieces of wall mosaic, but it's impossible to put them together because there is no link. So we were able to uh, put this face, which is make it similar to the wall mosaic of Mount Sinai, and it is practically from the same day. Uh, as far as marble, we had a conservator from Ravenna who came, and she is very good in, in marble. Uh, conservation and uh, this is an example of how we found the northern uh, 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 the southern isle apse and look at it with the fire and look how it was broken and this is when it was put together back every piece of it uh, was saved and it was put together and now you can see it is much cleaner than it is now this is how it looks like now with the uh, with the altar here this is from the other side. Next, please. Uh, the Panther vase, which is a, a, a very rare piece. There is no piece like it in the world. And this is considered one of the top uh, uh, in the exhibition that we have now, the top uh, uh, valuable piece that we have in the exhibition in, uh, that went to New York and Cincinnati and now in Grand Rapids. Uh, it was 130 pieces, like you see it here. That's how it was found. And this is when we started the reconstruction of it. Every piece is numbered and pinned and photographed. So if we want to take it apart, so it can be taken. And this is the next piece, the final uh, work it's a, it's of it. It's a meter tall. Yeah, it's a, it, I think this was used as a baptistry later when they start baptizing babies because, uh, next please. The older baptistry was here outside the church in the courtyard in this area and it is made in a cruciform shape 
with four columns supporting a dome, and it has two doors, uh, one in here and one here, and people will enter the baptistry as unclean and get baptized, and so they become saved, where people will be sitting on benches to congratulate them after this thing. This is a reconstruction of the baptistry. But later on, when they start baptizing their babies, they didn't need the, this baptistry. They start using a basin, like the panther vase, which was taken from a Roman or Nabataean uh, temple and reused in the church. Where was it found here? At in the church, in the uh, between the southern aisle and the nail, uh, in the middle almost, okay. or close to the door, not exactly the middle. And uh, like you see the same thing in the Orthodox Church in Madaba, you see this uh, brass uh, basin which is uh, smaller than this. Uh, and they baptize baby in it and it is just at the entrance of the church, in the, between the columns almost. Uh, the decision how to, what to do in, in uh, Petra, it was not our, my decision or my wife's decision. It was decided by committee that we selected from the Department of Antiquity, uh, Georgian University, and uh, people who are uh, involved in archaeology. So uh, many uh, things, especially the, the shelter we put, uh, we, had, uh, we gave a grant, uh, a prize of $5,000 for the best concept. We got six concepts from Australia, from England, and from Jordan, and nobody won because they were all uh, rejected by the committee. And then we gave the prize to the best two, which is Ammar was one of them. And then uh, we hired another architect who worked in Cyprus, in Papos, on the shelter. He's an American from New York. And he was very clever by asking the committee, what do you want from a shelter to do? And he gave answers, and they uh, marked the answers. And then he worked his shelter following their recommendation. That means it's to protect it from the rain and the sun, and it should be reversible, and uh, that it's going to be easy to take out and put back in uh, if we find better solution. So the solution was this one with low impact on the on Petra's uh, 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 geographical uh, area, and it is uh, light, and it, it is durable, and it can uh, take any earthquake, uh, take a, a a storm of 300 kilometers per hour. It can hold well, the, the hurricane of uh, Florida. So this is the way it was built, and the water is collected from, from the shelter. It comes in pipes that we put in through all channels into the uh, well that we found in the atrium um, of the church. Uh, lately, they were, there was a, a conference in New Mexico about the sheltering archaeological site, and this one won the best prize from the, the people as the best solution for, uh, for uh, uh, sheltering archaeological site. Now, this ended up, of course, was a problem for us because when we put the shelter, uh, we had to enlarge the excavation. We told the archaeologists, if you find mosaic, you're going to be fired because we have no money, we never budgeted for this. Sure enough, they didn't find the uh, mosaics. Uh, they found a stone pavement, but in the room adjacent to the church, uh, this room, under the fire layer, under five meters of debris, stones and sand and so on, we get to the fire layer, which is about uh, 25 centimeters thick or 30 centimeters. In this area, we found 152 rolls of papyrus. All these small rolls, like cigars, and they can roll up to 36 inches in length. Uh, we had to bring the president of the papyrology of the world from uh, Ann Arbor, who recommended a team from Finland, the academy, and they came and they did the conservation. I bought half a kilometer of glass to put the, the scroll inside. Sidi uh, of course, uh, His Royal Highness, uh, help us with this to bring them to Angkor because we don't want anybody who have no experience with this to deal with it. It's all charred, burned like cigarette paper, and if you blow on them, they will fly. 
So we were very careful, and the conservator did their work, and they glued them into a Japanese paper, and they are put between glass on a non-acid paper, and then they were photographed by a professional photographer, and later on they were scanned by Birmingham Young University, and now we are in the publication phase, and we had a policy, and access policy on this, and uh, there was the first publication that came uh, about a year and a half ago, and we're waiting now for them to give the second and the third, so they're going to be five uh, volumes on the scrolls of Petra. This project, the scrolls alone, they cost close to several three million dollars now that we have to raise from different places, and uh, th this is one of the things that we feel responsible for it. It's not like other archaeologists who excavate and go home, you know, we, uh, even the mosaics that you saw, these circlets and, uh, and these icons, I put them for adoption. I raised $110,000 from people who adopted a figure for its preservation, and now we have this money at ACOR, we can use only the interest. Whenever the church needs uh, any work, we can always bring a conservator from anywhere to do the work, and the money will stay untouched, you know, only we can use the interest from it. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, why, why, I want to so, have I the light, light, please. If we can have a light, I can switch to my slides. Yeah, while she's doing that, um, uh, the publication of this church, uh, uh, the publication of the church, it was reviewed recently. <laughs> by a professor from Princeton uh, University. I want to read for you a paragraph, which is makes me happy, you know, to see all the effort, where it's going. The excavation, recording, preservation, and restoration of the Petra Basilica was a cooperative venture, and so is the final report. The first of participating, uh, the list of the participating scholar is long and impressive, as is the list of patrons who supported the project. The scholars and patrons involved represent an international and truly cross-disciplinary mix. The Petra project proved beyond doubt that intelligent scholarly cooperation and the pooling of resources across multiple boundaries, national, political, linguistic, confessional, can produce very positive results. For hundreds of early Christian churches that survived at ground level or below ground level, in contrast to those that survived above ground across the, the continent, from Scotland to the Sudan, from the Atlantic to Central Asia, this volume is without peer. In the annals of early Christian archaeology, which is one of our oldest humanistic disciplines with the well-documented rules in the 6th century, see whatever, uh, there has never been a project like this, nor has there ever been a published final report of commensurate depth and brilliance. This volume is the new template against which all subsequent work into the foreseeable future of early Christian archaeology must be judged. And this is what our aim, without this gentleman doing this review, you know, it's a long review, but uh, this was our, our aim from the beginning, is to set a, a good example for other archaeologists to follow up. And I think Petra is becoming this kind of uh, uh, archaeological site where everyone is doing everything they can for uh, whatever project they are doing there. Hallelujah again. Thank you very much. Now let's put the lights down again. Why doesn't everybody stand up for a minute, take a break? <laughs> Let's just stand up a minute. And then I'll talk. I walked up to the top of the hill from the Petra Church um, up here just to see what was up there. We never walked up. And Tom sat down on some stones up here and he said, I'm sitting in the apse of the church. And, Tom, and Pierre, who was standing there, said, I'm standing in the doorway. Mm -hmm. And we took a good look at this structure and discovered that it was in, uh, I'm going to be stuck here. 
that it was in rather miserable uh, condition. Pierre, I think you're going to have to come and do the slides for me. Should I do that? Or, or, yeah. Otherwise, I'm standing in the way of um, We decided, this is 1994, we decided to do a very small project with just a few friends from here in Amman to clean it and put the walls back up because the walls were falling down this cliff and this cliff. And um, that project went on that way for about three or four years. And in the course of it, we uncovered this structure here, which is, became known as the Ridge Church. Next slide. Um, I'm now going to jump, however. Um, we then started work on another project farther down the hill. And um, my co-director on that project is here in the audience, Megan Perry. Um, and rather early in the project, we discovered that we had this set of columns. Um, each one of these is blue granite. Each one weighs a couple of tons. Um, and we discovered that we had a match set. And Megan and I were quite persuaded, or at least we were dreaming, that we had found military headquarters for <laughs> Petra. Until one day, one of the students standing this area said, you do know I'm standing in an apse. <laughs> so we had another church, which was not exactly what we were dreaming about. Go ahead, Pierre. No, the other way. Um, and what we have is now called the Blue Chapel. And the four columns, the blue granite columns, are here. Um, the Blue Chapel, and I'm really sorry that these slides are coming out so thin. I thought they would be stronger. The Blue Chapel turns out to be probably the chapel, private chapel, of the Bishop of Petra, or some other person of importance in Petra, the mayor, the uh, uh, head of the military, who knows. But it, it is a private chapel, because in all of this structure here, there is only one entrance, and that's down this very thin staircase here. So it's not a place where hordes of people would come in and out. Um, the two buildings are obviously joined by that staircase, and it's, it's likely, since the Petra Church being the Cathedral of Petra, we know that from the scrolls, is close by, that this is the residence of the Bishop of Petra from the late 5th century through the 6th century, maybe into the beginning of the 7th. Um, next slide. Um, it had all the features of a 6th century church, um, including in the northern apse a reliquary which was found by Marussia. <laughs> Reliquaries were installed in 6th century churches and continue to be used today in some Christian churches. Uh, they contained the bone of a saint or a piece of cloth that had touched the Holy Sepulchre or some sacred object. Um, and we had actually had found, when Marusi found the, the, the box itself, which was originally in a sort of niche, uh, the year before we had found the cover for it, so we have a complete uh, reliquary, uh, relatively rare. Um, Next slide, please. We also found in this church the base of a pulpit, um, <coughs> which had a steps, and I'm really sorry these slides did not come out very well, um, uh, steps going up to it, and then this is the base for the whole pulpit. Next slide. Um, we found pieces of this blue marble on the floor around that installation, and over the next year, Naif Zaban, who was, uh, Pierre was talking about, pieced together the marble uh, as best uh, as could be done. And then two conservators were brought from Athens, and they filled in the gaps here with plaster, and then actually carved the plaster to match the blue, and then stained it, so that now the blue pulpit looks like this. It's in, this is how it looks in the exhibit. It's quite, quite uh, outstanding. Next slide. We also restored the colonnade. Um, here are the, the uh, column drums. Um, it was quite an operation. That big crane went into Petra, and I didn't, wasn't sure we'd be able to have a crane in Petra, but they brought it in. Uh, and it was quite an operation watching them lift these big drums. Next slide, slide please. And that's what it looks like today. Um, a lot of people who see it wonder why I put up those cement columns. They are so perfect. They are in such good condition that people somehow don't want to believe that they are ancient. Um, People have a problem with the fact that they are blue granite. They're supposed to be pink because they're in Petra. But once you're actually there, they're absolutely beautiful. Go ahead. And they are from Turkey. Yes, they came originally they came from Turkey. Uh, the, the granite comes from Turkey. And they were used in a Nabataean 
structure, probably in front of the palace tombs, and then moved from the area of the palace tombs over to the Bethel Church. And the Byzantines actually numbered the pieces, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. Next slide, please. And this is the architect of the project is Chrysanthos Kamalopoulos. And this is his restoration of what the Blue Chapel looked like inside. Um, it actually is very small. Uh, not very many people would have been able to fit into it. Um, where the front of the picture is right here is just about where the back wall is. Next slide, please. And this is the atrium, our outside area of the church, um, where it's undercover. Next slide, please. That's where I think it was. Yeah, it was taking up here. <laughs> Uh, and another view of the Blue Chapel. Uh, if you're in Petra, do make the effort to walk up there to the <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, now returning to the aerial, aerial. This is the Petra Church here. And this is the ridge, which will become part of the story of the ridge. Um, the, this is quite a, a very uh, steep cliff. And this is relatively steep in here. Or places in here. The, um, the Nabataeans have built staircases so you can get up and down, but it's, it falls off. <coughs> and this area becomes extremely important, I think, in the Nabataean period. Next slide, please. Uh, because you can see everything from there. Um, this is, if you're standing, this is the Wadi Abu Laka, looking up toward Um Saigon. This is where the Ridge Church is now. And then you come around with Petra Shelter. Petra Shelter. Great Temple, Kestro Bint, um, Oviara, and on around. You can see everything from up there. You can see everything inside Petra, meaning that the logical people to have had that piece of real estate were the army, um, which is why that we began to believe that we had our headquarters. And I do believe that before a Byzantine church was built there, there was an army installation there. Next slide, please. Um, one of the reasons is that the whole of the, that hillside is honeycombed with shaft tombs. They go down, this one goes down three and a half meters into a room that's about four meters wide and five meters across. Um, this is Megan Perry here and the famous Hamudi who seems to find everything there is to be found in Petra. Uh, and this is tomb two, which was found at the top of the shaft at the top of the hill and excavated by Megan. Um, you see an attack burial. There were 38 burials in this tomb. And there were uh, small pieces of bronze, which someone has identified for me as being part of military uniforms. So that is part of a picture that goes with inscriptions that are up there, which led me to believe that the military was very much present up on the top of that hill. Next slide, please. Yes, with, the ins with inscriptions. In the tombs, the two tombs are here, tomb one and tomb two, which is the one we were just looking at, which, as I said, Dr. Meg Perry estimated. Um, we've taken out an extraordinary uh, collection of pottery. A lot of the pottery that you see in the museum at Petra and see elsewhere uh, has been purchased on the open market. Um, we have a collection of pottery from the first half of the first century from tomb one and the second half of the first century from tomb two that is exceptional. Um, and they will, I believe, wind up in the National Museum as a, uh, a study collection uh, of what, the, not the, the prettiest pieces, but a complete collection, selection of pottery of that period. Next slide, please. Um, the, the area at the top of the hill was uh, a building, um, a, a rectangular building with a cistern under it. Um, at some point, it was converted to be a church, perhaps by the military themselves. Um, and this happened very early uh, in terms of Christian churches. The great earthquake at Petra took place in AD 363. And a lot of Petra was abandoned after that. And not very long after that, this building was, re was rebuilt and converted into a church. Um, next slide. Um, this very nice uh, uh, drawing of the Ridge Church is done by uh, Adi Jagri. Um, did a couple of things uh, for us up there. Um, and we always loved having him sitting up on that high rock with his um, painting. Go ahead. Um, at about AD 600, all these churches were abandoned. Uh, it's a little bit earlier, a little bit later, we're not sure. Uh, the reason we think from various archaeological hints 
and also from what we know of the scrolls, that there just came a point where living inside Petra was no longer viable. Um, the reason is that the water system collapsed. There's not enough water inside Petra to sustain a very large population. Water has to come in in aqueducts, in um, channels, and so on. And there's archaeological evidence that the channels had blocked up. People tried to repair them. Um, but gradually the population, at least the way it looks from the scrolls, is simply moving out because they've got better land outside. Uh, a remnant population amounting to, I think, no more than about 200 people stays inside of Petra, and they live as sort of squatters in the abandoned buildings. Um, this is a drawing by Chrysanthus Kanalopoulos of these, this remnant population living in the Ridge Church, in the atrium of the Ridge Church, uh, and almost everything you see in that drawing is based on archaeological evidence. Next. Um, they lived from uh, robbing tombs. Uh, you have to admire them. They're making a living in a very hostile environment. Uh, and we believe that they were selling the, what they could find. They were scavenging lead. They were scavenging glass. Uh, obviously gold that they could get out of tombs. Um, they were eating an awful lot of fish from the reef at Aqaba, uh, parrotfish, which I think gives a hint that they were taking a lot of these materials and selling them to Aqaba. Uh, and trading them for other goods, including fish. Um, we know from inside the uh, Blue Chapel uh, that they were living at a certain point inside, and they had campfires. And from one of those campfires, we were able to extract a piece of bone, which went for uh, uh, carbon 14 dating, which told us the next part of the story. Uh, oh, this population was speaking Arabic. Um, this uh, one of them scratched into this stone, Bismillah. And that's Kufic Arabic. So they, they were in Petra uh, late enough um, to be Arabic speakers. In the next phase, we had a catastrophic earthquake. And according to the carbon 14 dating, this is the 749-50 earthquake, which is the same earthquake that brings down uh, the great the columns on the citadel uh, in Amman. And uh, sorry for the quality of these slides. I'm really disappointed that they've come out. Uh, you see the percussion uh, fractures on the edges of the granite. As the columns wobble, their, their edges are cracked. Next slide, please. Um, and here's a place where this drone came from the top of the column and went straight down and hit. Look at the damage it did as it hit. Next slide. Um, and then the population, the, the buildings are abandoned. This population goes away. Next slide. And the place just goes to rubble until it's cleared for agriculture later. But this is the sort of rubble that covered the whole of, of all of these buildings. Next slide, please. Now we're going to just take a quick look out at Baida, what I've been doing for the last three years. Um, this is the little seat here. Um, this is the road from Om Saihun, where you turn here. This is the village, uh, the Amarin village. Um, and here we have Amti Canyon. Next slide, please. And even closer, here's the road going this way to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, here's Amti Canyon. The little seat is here, and where, the, where you park if you're going to bay is here. Um, next slide, please. In Amti Canyon, there's a square building, 24 meters on a side, that I was just always curious what it was. And three years ago, I started, I, I thought it was a cistern. And I thought it was worth cleaning out, because uh, it, could, it could be used locally. Um, it turned out not to be a cistern at all. Next slide. Um, it's actually a very large, probably sacred building, um, which we know from a canopy, fragments of a canopy that was found in it, a, a large decorated arch, which probably was somewhere inside here with a statue or an altar or a sacred tree under it. Um, it was approached, this building was approached by a very elaborate uh, sidewalk uh, or walkway arrangement that goes across the canyon and then goes down the canyon for 130 meters. Next slide, please. Is something you can fix the color? No, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to call it. This is the walkway up the side of the canyon. Next slide, please. Um, here is the square building, the walkway, and the walkway here. Um, further look at this <coughs> led us to understand that, in fact, what we have uh, beyond the, other than the square building, here is a, a large winery of the Nabataean period. There are two wine presses. They're quite impressive. If you've been on Dubaida, don't miss them. Um, the two fields together amount to about 23,000 square meters. 
and I uh, got some help to calculate how much wine would have been grown in antiquity on, uh, given that the, they wouldn't have had the, uh, the same technology that you have today. Uh, but it would be the equivalent of around 8,000 bottles of wine uh, per year, which is a commercial quantity. So they were producing wine for probably consumption in Petri. Next slide. Um, we have a triclinium out there, which also has a wine preference. Um, next slide. This is one of the wine presses, um, the large basin. You see that's a one meter stick, so you see how large the tramping uh, area is. Next slide. And this is how it was used. It was actually roofed, um, pressing here, obviously people tromping. We go down into a small basin here, and then into a large basin, and then we take it out on that side. Uh, stored in ceramic jars, in some, probably uh, in some of the caves nearby. Next slide. Um, the next year we worked here, in this area, and then last year here. Next slide. Um, in the upper area, we've got a large uh, cistern. Uh, one of the largest in the region, up 16,000 cubic meters. Um, and it actually could be used today if it were cleaned up, uh, but it's, it, yeah, we would also have to clean up the feeding area to feed into it. Next slide. Um, but we've been able to understand exactly how the water system in this area works. Next slide. Um, below that, um, toward the Little Seep, there's a large area called the village, uh, which I believed uh, to be um, Nabataean. Um, next slide, please. It's here. If you, you actually, in the satellite photographs, you can make out a white area here and a white area here, and where you see rows and rows and rows of walls. So I thought we were finally going to be able to get a Nabataean, simple Nabataean housing area where we could learn more about the people instead of about their, about their temples and, and major buildings. Next slide. Uh, and in fact, we got the rows and rows and rows of little buildings, each one with a little doorway. Uh, but they're crusader and not Nabataean. This was a big surprise. Um, uh, it turned out, I was helped with this by uh, Professor Bonanini uh, from Florence, who is a specialist on the crusaders in the Petra region, uh, who, who was able to find one reference for me. There is one reference in crusader literature to buy them. So <coughs> these are the, and I have an instinct, if I'm just speculating, that probably um, this is the population who were growing crops to feed the big castles. You couldn't grow anything up at Shobak. Um, somebody's got to grow the food to feed these big castles. <coughs> or Huera, the, the other big castles around the region. And this year, we worked here. Um, and in a big surprise, got an Abitian cavern that we decided to haul, we decided to clean out, removed all of this, removed three meters of uh, goat souvenirs and found another Byzantine church um, with, yes, with a... <laughs> they they followed me around. They followed me. I actually stopped working inside the entry because I was afraid I'd get another church. And this one, they, they, they followed me. Um, this is a bishop's chair. This is actually kind of interesting because this is a case where a Nabataean hall was turned into a Byzantine church. It was then cleaned down and reused by the Crusaders. Next slide, please. Yes. Next slide. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Not for I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Pia. No, I, I can to I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. It is it's great that all the work you have done and uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, one of, uh, if I may say, one of the uh, also projects that uh, Pierre did from A to Z is the church that I <laughs> With the support of the College of Mind Foundation. Thank you all. Do you have any questions? The questions will hang around. Yes. Yes. Question. Yeah. What did you find about uh, the type of grape? Oh, we don't know anything about the type of grape. No. We, we Which is called the labial. Local formats say yes. that beda does not refer to white rock, as many people think, but white 
grapes. So. Ah, and there is one ah, type of no, grape, it's no. called the labyard, and mm -hmm. it's now in Saudi Arabia, they still have it using it. And possibly it was it. There is one uh, winery, it has a grape wine in it. I want to go get a stick from it and see which kind of grapes it is. If it's it a remnant. Possibly it's a remnant. The area there is called El Kurum uh, today. So it is an area where it's a huge area. We have 27 wine presses in the whole uh, surrounding area. Looking, all over the place. So it was a very high uh, uh, production of wine. And uh, but on the other side, uh, south of Petra, grapes are grown. Obviously not for wine, uh, but but grapes are grown still till today for, for table grapes. In fact, large areas of table grapes south of Petra, immediately. It's uh, about uh, 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 looking some Greek mythology in the church. Mm -hmm. How is it possible? Because uh, they were really there, there was in the sixth century. There was a, a sort of classical revival. Um, where and you'll see this if you go to the Palatus Hall in Matava, you see it obviously in the Petra Church, you see it in many, many mosaics where they have simply brought back the classical themes as a way of expressing uh, some Christian. Uh, it, it's, it's, and it's not always obvious. You, you see Aphrodite, she is called the seasons too. She is, of course, as it is presented in the church, which we find to be the Virgin Mary Church. Virgin Maria, God bearer. Yeah. And she is the one who produced God. So there is a relation to that. And, uh, you know, in the catacombs in Rome, we have uh, Hercules, because mm -hmm. he was worshipped. Like St. George here, who later became uh, Khadr. Uh, 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 yeah, people is still believe in this church, the cave mainly. But they think And he was originally Hercules. And this was the temple of Hercules here, yeah. not on the city. So, this, so many this people. This site is really an extraordinary site because it's a continuous occupation, sacred site. And people think the temple of uh, Amman, the great temple up on the city that is Hercules. This is the one. We have the inscription, which was reused in the church. And all these big stones are Roman, and the columns are Roman. And in the inscription it says the governor of Amman celebrated the Herculaneum. So it is very clear. And then we have another inscription of Trajan. So they, all those were used in the Roman temple that existed before the church. And when they did the church, they remodeled. And usually Hercules is associated with caves like uh, St. George is. What else? Okay, one more. One more. One more. One more. I just was wondering, you said that the image of Petra was about 600 years, near 680. But you are implying that the crusaders inhabited by the afterwards during the Yes, Arcadia. yes, and, yeah. and, and, Petra. and much later. And Petra. Well. And Petra. They go into Petra, I'm sorry. Petra is, is abandoned as a navity in operation by the local population around 600. Yeah. Between six and seven hundred, yeah. uh, because it's just not viable anymore. But the Crusaders come back in six centuries later, yes. uh, because and that's and as far that's as far east as the Crusaders ever go, yeah. and they don't they last here what a hundred years? It's not very long. Um, they don't last nearly as long, and they begin retreating from here pretty quickly. Um, Mainly Karak, Shobak, yeah. Habis, Wa'ira, yeah. and uh, Hormos, which is we, can, we didn't find yet. It's just in Baida. Somewhere there. And uh, Aqaba, or it could be the Pharaoh's island today. Yeah. Those was to protect the trade coming to Jerusalem. Yeah. They didn't care northward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and how did they deal with the water problem? When they were inside, you yeah. know, I don't know the answer to that question. They probably revived the Nabataean cisterns. Uh, and of course, they were not trying to run a city, they were, they were soldiers. Uh, it's very different from trying to deal with a, a population of 10, yeah. 20, or 30,000. Yeah. Um, and they probably just, uh, out of it would not be an issue because you would revive the big sisters out there. Uh, and inside the country, they probably did the same thing. Bire is still yeah. functioning. Function. Diana Kirkbride in, in the recent history. Yeah. And it's still today the main source of water for the people there. Yeah. 
Were these churches operational concurrently? Yes. Or over different periods of time? Why are so many churches together? That is, it's, 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 it's what I call the Abdoom effect. Each one, no, many of them have in them, in, in, in Mount of it, there's 14 of them stacked up against each other. And they all have these mosaics saying, donated by so and so, donated by so and so, donated by so and so. Everybody wants to have it. So everybody had to donate. Like the mosques today, you want to go to heaven, you build the mosques. And this is why you want to go to heaven. Uh, every uh, every quarter of the town, really. I think about 1,400 mosques. Uh, there are 22 churches so far. Uh, better way of eight so far. And, uh, and on the way to the gate, once you took us, there were a few churches. Oh, there's Five several different towns in this. Just huge. The Dr. Rasas has 14 churches so far, which is small. So I would guess Petra would have like 25 to keep up with the church. Mm -hmm. We know about others, but we don't want to date the person. <laughs> <laughs> Last week I was in Rahab and they told wow. me that they have 26 churches there. Mm -hmm. And the oldest mm -hmm. church in history. Right, well, they say that, yeah. but we have no yeah, problem. That's what they say. That's what they say. Yeah. But there's, there's a site that really needs some help. That the, the churches there have been just covered over with a little bit of dirt and left, and they're being damaged. They're just, there's, no, there's no maintenance there at all. That's why we did the endowment for the church in Vectra because it needs maintenance. Well, nothing, nothing left forever. Everything needs always to be taken care of. And this is a big burden on the Department of Antiquity to leave all these sites for saying, oh, we didn't do this, we didn't do that, but it really is. A high cost is not uh, cheap to do, to maintain all these uh, projects. And they don't have the budget to do all the things that they would like to do. That's why training Jordanian will be much better than bringing foreigners with high cost. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.